Luca, and he will talk about influence of mutations on the compactness of viral single-stranded RNA genomes in continuation of the work that we started in the morning. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Roya. So, well, first of all, I want to thank the, to thank the organizer for inviting me here. Uh, you know, the first, uh, uh, I consider a bit the beginning of my career uh, as a scientist coming here to ICTP for a conference just before my uh, PhD started. And of course, I was among the audience. I wasn't presenting anything. And so it's a bit of an emotion being the first, for the first time on the other side of the auditorium uh, in ICTP. Uh, so as I said, I will talk about the effect of synonymous mutations in uh, single-stranded viral RNA genomes, their impact on the size of the of said genomes. And uh, I will also present some new results about the effect of the distributions of mutations on uh, said genomes. Now, this work, so many of you will have heard the first half of this, uh, of this presentation, and the second half will be dedicated to the new result. For those who haven't, uh, well, it all started when I was in Ljubljana working with Trudy. I started working on uh, RNA, that with uh, Angers, also who was finishing his thesis. And one night, coming back from Trieste to Ljubljana by car with uh, Christian, who was going, uh, coming there for a uh, to give a seminar, we started talking about Bill's work, and Christian mentioned, okay, but you know, the, I would very like to know what happens if you consider synonymous mutations. Because I've asked them, and they couldn't, had not looked yet into it, and I, okay, we can try to look uh, into that. And this came out of it, I'm very happy about this uh, collaboration. Uh, so. Well, the introduction, I believe, I can skip by now since we had it uh, from uh, Galbart, uh, from Bill, and from Avi, also part of the results. Uh, but yeah, it all starts from the different packaging mechanisms between uh, double-stranded DNA viruses uh, and uh, single-stranded uh, RNA viruses. And uh, as Bill very efficiently pointed out with that slide showing how much bigger the double-stranded DNA is than the single-stranded RNA, it becomes clear how the phenotypic uh, um, properties of these two polymers will influence how they are packaged into the capsid. So you require a motor with uh, double-stranded DNA viruses, while single-stranded RNA is a self-assembly process. And uh, again, as was pointed out this morning, in vivo, the right uh, uh, RNA is recognized by the capsid. How that is so, it's a well, very fascinating object of research. So there are, as Raidon pointed out, uh, packaging signals in MS2. Some other viruses are believed to not have them, actually. Uh, size turns out to be important. And perhaps there will be also other, several other things, but those are, for the moment, the ones that are uh, and known. And of course, electrostatic plays a very huge role in all of this. Um, so talking about, about the size of the RNA fold, as Avi was, uh, Avi pointed out, there is a correlation between the size uh, of the viral RNA and the size of the capsid, which pointed them to study, uh, now it's kind of a temporal loop I'm presenting your old result after you present mine, uh, pointed them to study what was the size of uh, viral RNAs compared to random RNAs. So Avi already presented uh, all of this this morning, but this, I will have the slide again. This is, it is the starting point for basically what we did. Uh, long story short, you can, as they said, associate a measure to an RNA fold, which is its diameter, the maximum ladder distance. You have to consider uh, an ensemble, a thermal ensemble of folds, since they are so large that the minimum free energy fold will not tell you much. There are very many folds within 1 kBT of energy. And uh, if you then consider 
what is the scaling for a random RNA which has a composition, uh, the average nucleotide composition of viral RNA, you obtain that power law, which goes this, and power two thirds. And instead, if you consider, if you measure numerically, what is the size of the viral, uh, viral RNA coming from icosahedral capsid, you get uh, the points, oh, I do have the pointer. You get the points, uh, I, mm. well, you get the point. Why did it change slide? <laughs> Sorry. Ah, so, okay, my bad. So you, you get the points uh, again. You, I should have tried also this before. You get the points below. So the viral RNA is more, uh, is more compact. This uh, is seen also in experiment. This slide also was <laughs> seen before. And, uh, and yet, as, I, as it was already said, the interesting part is that really, if you get the radius of gyration uh, from this MLD, you get a size which is comparable with that of the caps uh, of the mature capsid. If you look at the trace in cry of RNA in cryo IM and the size of the capsid, again, you get a comparable size. So the question then is, uh, uh, is this uh, compactness, this phenotypic characteristic of the genome, uh, something which is uh, selected for independently of other properties, or is it uh, a consequence of some other evolutionary pressure of the virus, uh, which are acting on the virus? The first one to, the first one to check is, uh, uh, the, is the requirement for the virus to encode uh, for its own proteins. And that's what we set out to study. So I will uh, run a bit. The first uh, part of, uh, of the talk will be dedicated to this question. And this is the plan for it. It's what we followed. We went for, first of all, we recovered the uh, the result, just to be sure we had everything uh, set all right. Then we started to include, uh, to mutate the viral uh, the viral RNAs with stricter and stricter constraints. So we started by including the denucleotide frequencies, which allow you to distinguish between one viral families and the other. Then we allow only, allow the only synonymous mutation, which preserve the protein uh, product. And finally, we, we conserved also the untranslated regions at the beginning of the end of the genomes, which are important for uh, the secondary structure which is present there and the codon frequencies. I will come more detail, to explain in more detail later. <coughs> so, the recovering your result, well, we consider the, the same uh, viral uh, RNA compositions for the power law here, at the beginning. But we also consider the timoviridae-like uh, random RNA sequences. Timoviridae were not considered in the original study because they have quite, well, quite different composition. And it turns out that uh, those changes affect only the prefactor while the scaling uh, is basically the same. This. So having this uh, set, we went on, uh, so all was done with VNRNA also in our case, by the way. We went on including the next, the first constraint, which is the denucleotide frequencies. That is, how frequent a pair of nucleotides appear in the virus with respect to a random population. And as you see here from the graphs of all different uh, families we consider, you can really distinguish one from the other if you, if you check. And uh, we put this constraint in with a fictitious energy, basically, in our Monte Carlo scheme which was then uh, 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 removed later. Basically, we only kept, in the end, those uh, sequences which, uh, which were within uh, uh, a certain distance from the, from the average, uh, average denucleotide frequencies we wanted. Synonymous mutations was the next constraint. So 
um, I believe you are, all of you already know, but normally we get from DNA strands to a uh, messenger RNA to protein synthesis. The, there is a triplet, so each uh, amino acid is encoded by three nucleotides, and that's how we go from the four code letter of the nucleic acids to the 20 letters uh, alphabet of the proteins. And uh, the main point is that if you consider how you can translate uh, triplets of uh, four nucleotide of four letter alphabet into an alphabet with 20 letters, it turned out you have, well, 64 possible triplets, only 20 letters out of it. Three of those triplets code for stop sequences, so there must be some degeneracy in the, in the product, meaning uh, there will be several triplets which code for the same amino acid, and that is uh, what we call the genetic code in the end. So here it is, come, taken directly from the Albert's book. You see that some, uh, I mean, some amino acids are very degenerate and others are not. And, yeah. and the, the question is, are, these, are the mutations which preserve the protein product? So if you mutate, for example, a, a GGU triplet only within one of these three, so that we still have glycine, are those neutral? Or do they disrupt uh, the, um, the fold, the RNA fold? So we said to find that this is was our method. We have Mon Monte Carlo scheme. Mutation with change amino acid are rejected. There is an energy on the denucleotide frequencies, and then we take, uh, we filter the sequences a posteriori. We consider 122 uh, viruses. For each one, we kept between 500 and 2,000 uh, sequences. And for each sequences, we produced 500 folds, on which then, uh, I mean, a thermal ensemble of 500 folds, on which then uh, we evaluated the MLD. <coughs> uh, just to check, the nucleotide frequencies turn out to be about right if we fix all of this. Uh, this is the result, which you already saw <laughs> this morning. As you can see, doing this, so it's only synonymous mutation and maintaining a, a nucleotide, denucleotide frequencies, brings the MLD, average MLD of the viral uh, genomes all the way up to the scaling law for uh, random RNAs, which is Pretty interesting. It was very, we were very happy when we found out this result because it was confirming uh, beautifully uh, Bill and Avi uh, paper. And uh, we decided also to go on and include further, further uh, constraints later. But before doing that, we wanted to see since those were mutated uh, really uh, as much as possible, we wanted to see how many mutations it took to destroy this compactness. In order to do that, we consider only four viruses, four genomes, and we started to do what we call the mutation dynamics. Which basically, instead of printing uh, the sequences uh, out when they were really uh, independent of each other, we printed them out every few steps and uh, uh, computed the MLD again for each one of them. And here you can see how it goes. So this is, well, Monte Carlo steps, basically. It depends on the length of the genome. But you see that uh, almost immediately, the average MLD goes all the way to the value we have a, a saturation of the mutations, so the, var uh, the random RNA one, basically. This is a time of reader, which is a bit uh, more strange in behavior. And on the right hand side, you have a sequence similarity instead of time. And uh, you can see, for example, here, that when the sequence similarity is reduced by 5, 10%, well, we have already destroyed uh, the compactness, basically. And uh, 
depends a bit on the virus, but for this two, for the BMV, for example, five ten percent is enough. <coughs> this will become important in the second part of the talk. Um, also, an interesting part, which will also, which will be further uh, seen later, is that if you look at the very beginning here, when there are few mutations, those can enhance the compactness even. Uh, why? Well, arguably because uh, if a virus or an organism, or that matters, optimize uh, for some uh, phenotypic product, it will have to do a compromise with something else. So no optimization is uh, complete. We want to stay in a spot, perhaps, that allows you some uh, possibility to optimize something else if the environment uh, around you requires so. So as I was saying, we moved on to include uh, uh, two other constraints, which are the untranslated regions at the beginning of the end, we left untouched. We mutated only the, the, the genes. And uh, we conserved the codon, codon usage bias. Uh, what I mean by codon usage bias, if someone doesn't know, uh, as I pointed out before, there are several equivalent codons which code for the same uh, amino acid. But uh, depending on the organism, not one codon is usually more represented than another one. So they are not really equivalent in the cell since you have uh, different proportions of the equivalent ones. In order to take into account this, we shuffled the equivalent codons within the, within the genomes. So in this case, we did not conserve the denucleotide frequencies but we did conserve nucleotide frequencies and codon frequencies. And those are uh, the, um, the orange points. And you see that still, even with these further strong constraints, the mutations uh, do destroy uh, the compactness of the virus. So, from this, we can conclude with some safety that, uh, yeah, the compactness appears to be uh, evolutionarily selected. <coughs> now, going to the second part of the talk, as Avi was pointing out this morning, there is the, the question, what causes uh, this compactness? And we already saw uh, that uh, the pairing Frequencies are the same between the mutated, as you said, between the mutated viruses, uh, mutated sequences, and the uh, wild type sequences. The length of the duplexes, average length of the duplexes, is the same. Even if you keep uh, the same proportion of uh, of uh, degree of ranging point, the same distribution, you can have. Uh, if you move them around randomly, you do have uh, a size which is larger. One observation they did, I'm always starting from your papers, it appears, uh, is that, in fact, considering uh, viral RNAs, we have uh, that uh, high degree branching points tend to cluster in the center of the fold, basically. And that does reduce, uh, uh, does reduce the size of the fold. So from this, we started uh, to wonder if there is, uh, perhaps on the sequence, some uh, hot spots, some stretches of sequence, which forces the high degree branching points to come uh, uh, near each other, basically. So the final question we would like to answer is, of course, what does cause uh, the fault compactness? Is there a particular property of the sequence, a code, if you want, that causes for this. We are moving toward trying to answer that step by step. And the first thing we, we looked at after uh, the first study is uh, if there is simply some stretches mutating which you destroy the compactness, or if there is not. So to answer uh, this, we took into consideration two virus, uh, two viral genomes, BMVRNA2 and uh, phage MS2, which are believed to have very different packaging mechanisms. Uh, MS2, as we have uh, seen, has some strong packaging signals, 
BMV RNA2 is believed to be mostly electrostatic. They are both um, and size, they are both compact, and they are about the same size from 2,600 to 3,500 nucleotides, BMV RNA2 and MS2. And uh, <clears throat> on these two viruses, we consider the different kind uh, of mutations distribution, localized mutations, if you want. So first, we considered batches of uh, mutations which are local on the genome. So up here, we mutated everything in the orange window, then we moved it, we moved it, we moved it, and so on. Uh, then we considered the average fold, and we mutated the those portions of the fold, which are uh, um, first the most central, and then we moved out to the least central. And finally, for a comparison, we took into account completely random, randomly placed mutation, dispersed ones. Uh, for each, for each uh, window, we produced 100 independent sequences, and uh, for each sequence, 500 folds again, we conserved only the denucleotide, uh, denucleotide uh, frequencies this time, where the mutations are not synonymous. We wanted to keep it uh, as general as possible. Um, <clears throat> forgot again. So let's go on with the first. Perhaps the movie will clarify it a bit. The first one is. Uh, uh, we simply move the window around. Each time we produce 100 independent sequences. And uh, for each one of those, we compute uh, the MLD. We consider then different sizes of the windows to see if there is some uh, specific contiguous part of the genome which encode for the compactness. If there is, at a point we will mutate one and everything will explode. That is the, the idea. So here you can see for BMV RNA2 and FHMS2, wild type uh, expected uh, average MLD, shuffled genome, which is the, basically the power law. And for two different uh, sizes of the mutation blocks, 120 nucleotides in green and 720 nucleotides in green, what is the MLD along along the genome. So here you have the center of each windows. And there is not much happening. I mean, for BMV RNA2, there is a spot in the center which is a bit more sensible to this kind of mutations. But even if we consider 720 nucleotides, which correspond to 20%, by the way. So this is what, with the synonymous mutation, was disrupting MLD for, uh, as for the quantity. Even in that case, we don't reach the, uh, the power law. For phage MS2, things are uh, even worse, if you want, so that we don't we reach it even less. Um, below, on the bottom row, you can see the histograms of the MLD obtained and combining all the values of MLD for uh, all mutations sites, and really, it doesn't change uh, so much from the wild type distribution. For the small windows, basically, it doesn't change at all. So we went on then uh, wondering if uh, perhaps is being central uh, on the fold, which is important. So it's not a contiguous batch along the genome which encodes for this property, but some uh, uh, different batches which come together to form the center. And to do so, we basically put a, a, a measure of uh, centrality, which I described in the next slide. And we ranked uh, with that all the nucleotides of the, of the fold. And uh, we formed our windows, depending uh, our uh, batches of mutation, depending on how central the nucleotide is. So it goes like this. From the most central one, our mutation moved outside till they reach the tip of the average fold. And uh, here you can see what would be the most central batch, which on the genome is like this, and the least central batch, which corresponds to the three tips, which is a 
given by three different stretches of, uh, of the genome. Uh, as a measure of centrality, we use the ladder distance again. So if you consider the ladder distance, the set of points which have uh, the lowest uh, uh, ladder distance to each other points on the, on the fold define the center, basically. Then you can consider for each nucleotide what is its ladder distance to this set of points, and that is our measure of centrality. Because the lower the lower, uh, the lower this ladder distance, the most central we are. Uh, this, for those of you who are familiar with graph theory, is basically equivalent to eccentricity, which would be the maximum, uh, the maximum distance from one point to each one, every other point on the graph. And the point with the lowest eccentricity is the center of the graph. So we can, we can get this measure. We average it over the ensemble. So we get uh, an average distance from the center. And uh, we rank our mutations uh, according to that. Uh, here you can see from the BMV RNA2 and the phage MS2 the profiles uh, of this uh, distance from the center, the average. And in gray, we have the standard deviations from this, uh, from this uh, average profiles, and you see that near the center, the deviation is not so much for BMV RN2. Well, MS2 is a bit more noisy, but still, if we consider a big enough window, we are safe that even on different folds, we are uh, keeping uh, the central, uh, the most central regions. So now we consider the most central part, 20% of the genome, the least central 20% uh, of the fold, sorry, and also the, the one which will be in the middle. And you can see the, the effect of the mutations here. Uh, unexpectedly, actually, the most, central, the most central portion is the one uh, which causes the least disruption. So if we mutate the most central portions of the genomes, uh, we are influencing the fold the least. While the other two, the mid and far 20%, have more or less the same, uh, the same effect. Still, none of these reaches the shuffle genome uh, distribution. So finally, to have a comparison, we took into account uh, uh, dispersed mutations. So, okay. So mutation which were, as you can see, are just randomly taken around the, around the genome. And so we have more or less the fact that we had to be the synonymous one, if you want. They are uniformly distributed. And in this case, going from 120 to 720 nucleotide, we really see the change toward the shuffled genome distribution. <coughs> and comparing these uh, different kind of mutations, oh, sorry, uh, to go back to the previous slide. Uh, compared to different kind of uh, mutations, so block, the centrality ranked, and the dispersed, sorry, it's written diffuse there, we see that the dispersed mutation, which are in dark blue here, are the only one which reaches the, um, the power law, basically, for the MLD, when we mutate 20% of the genome, which was the uh, amount of mutation which were seen to be disruptive in our previous study. So from this, what we get is that uh, whatever property is encoding for the compactness is really a global property of the, of the RNA in our, or at least it is on a scale which is bigger than a stretch of 20% of, uh, of the RNA. Uh, yeah, we went up to 720 nucleotides. Perhaps if we went up to a third or so, we would have seen something different, uh, I don't know, but the results point out to, really for, to it really being a, a, a global property. So wrapping up, so I should be on time. The um, take home message is that, yeah, viral compactness appears to be uh, evolutionarily selected for, and uh, it appears also to be resilient to localized mutations. 
The open questions that remains, of course, is what is causing this uh, viral compa this, this compactness? What is the, the code, if there is a code, giving it the genomes. And we don't have a, <laughs> an answer with this. We hope we would like to. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, your attention and to all to, to those who contributed to this study. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>